Who is this Jesus that we hear so much about? Who is He really? Sin cannot be in the presence of God. You see, God loves us. And He wants to be close to us. Do we truly comprehend what that means? Hello everyone, it's wonderful to be with you again, this opportunity for us to, to get into the Word of God and study what uh, truths God has given to us. We have a wonderful study uh, for you. Uh, we're going to take a look at something that Jesus said, some specific instructions that He's given to us that we don't hear talked about very much at all. You know, the Bible talks about uh, 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 honoring those who honor Him. Those who honor God, He will honor. That's what the Bible says. And here is one particular case we're going to look at, and I'm anxious to share with you. And before we get started into that study, any time we want to open the Word of God, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to be with us and to guide us, uh, because He's the one who inspired these words. And so, if it's possible for you to do so, I invite you to kneel with me now, and let's have a word of prayer together, and then we can get into this, this good uh, study of instructions that Jesus has given. So please kneel with me now if you can. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy holy name. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come together and study out of your holy word. We thank you that you preserve this word for us who live here in this time and that we have the opportunity uh, to learn the truth. And so, Father, we pray that you will give us to the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will give us wisdom. We claim the promise found in James. If we ask for wisdom, it shall be given. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will lead us into the truth, give us spiritual discernment, that we may discern truth from error. And, Lord, we pray especially that the Holy Spirit will cultivate within us a love for the truth that we discover. And, Lord, we pray that you will forgive us for our sins. We claim the blood of Jesus, who... Uh, paid the ultimate penalty for us. He died on Calvary's cross so that we may have eternal life. And so we pray that you forgive us our sins. We claim that blood to wash them away. And we pray for grace to overcome the temptations of the devil. And Lord, I ask humbly that you give me the words to speak here. And as we study your word, may we uh, uh, take this truth, uh, learn it for ourselves, study to show ourselves approved, and share this truth with, with others. We thank you again for Jesus, and we pray these things in His name, for He is so worthy. Amen. Well, beloved, if you will take your Bibles, I'd like to introduce you to this study uh, by taking a look in Matthew 26. Now, we're going to read, like I said, we're going to read some very specific instructions from Jesus. Now, this was... Six days, this particular event was six days before the crucifixion. This was on a Saturday night, as we would call it. The crucifixion was on the following Friday morning. So we'll go to Matthew chapter 26 and specifically take a look at uh, verses 12 and 13 of Matthew chapter 26. Now again, this is Jesus speaking. And Jesus said, For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Now, like I said, the Bible talks about uh, when we uh, honor God, He will honor us. And this is a particular incident where we see this uh, laid out. This is very specific instruction from Jesus about, about what we are supposed to preach. You would think, now, you would think that if Jesus said, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, uh, what this woman has done is going to be told as a memorial to her. You would think that when Jesus said that, you'd think this would be one of the most common subjects for preachers. But it isn't. And as I thought about this, I was almost embarrassed at how few times that I can remember that I actually preached uh, upon this subject myself. It's strange, really, when uh, we think about it, that when we've been given uh, specific instructions 
uh, from Jesus on something, no matter what it is, that we uh, so often don't do it. Is it not strange that when Jesus would point out certain things, like He'd say, study this, or preach about this, or, or teach this, but somehow we just don't seem to get it? I was wondering, when was the first time that uh, I can remember ever hearing somebody preach about this subject? And the first time that I can remember was uh, by a previous pastor of mine a long time ago. Now. I was uh, just over, I think, around 30 years of age. And I've not preached about it uh, uh, myself. And I thought, well, maybe we should be studying this a little more often than we do. I mean, by the words of the Savior Himself, this is a very important subject. It is in all four of the Gospels. And by the way, there are not very many stories that are in all four of the Gospels. Did you know that? I read somewhere that 92% of the Gospel of John is unique to his Gospel. Only 8% of the Gospel of John is in the other Gospels. And sometimes we think that, well, they're just four different versions of all the same things. But that's not true. So when you think about that, there are only a few stories that are in all four of the Gospels. And if some story is in all four of the Gospels, like uh, the crucifixion, or like this particular story, maybe that story is especially important. And concerning this, not only is it in all four of the Gospels, but Jesus said, wherever this Gospel is going to be preached, in all the world, that's everywhere, this story of what this woman has done is going to be told of a memorial of her. So it is appropriate for us to study it, is it not? Now what is this story about? Well, you have your Bibles there. Let's turn back to Luke chapter 13. And let's read a scripture to get us started here. Luke chapter 13, and specifically verse 23. It's interesting. It says, Then said one unto him, that's, they're speaking to Jesus, Lord, are there few that be saved? Are there few that be saved? I have been interested as I've studied the gospel story that very few times did Jesus actually tell somebody, you are saved. Now that sounds... Incredible, doesn't it? You would think that Jesus said that uh, uh, a numeral amount of times. You couldn't count the number of times that Jesus said it, but actually very few times. Very few times did Jesus actually tell somebody, you are saved. This day is salvation, come to this house, for example, he said. Now Jesus did not say that, that very often. Another interesting thing is that every time that he did say it, it was to somebody whom other people thought could not be saved. Now that's been very interesting to me. For instance, one of the times that Jesus said to somebody, this day is salvation come to this house, was to Zacchaeus. Do you know who Zacchaeus was? Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And in their society that was as low as you could go. You know, they used to, to uh, talk in their society about the tax collectors and the harlots. Right? You had the tax collectors and you had the harlots. A woman who was a harlot was as low as you could go as a, as a woman. And a tax collector was as low as you could go for a man. That's how they, they looked at it. You were at the bottom rung of society. Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. And so they felt that his case was hopeless. And they taught in the synagogues that people who did what he did were hopeless. But when Jesus met Zacchaeus, he said, This day is salvation come to this house. It's in Luke 19 verse 9. That's what he said to Zacchaeus. 
And this is an interesting story. Not our story, though, <laughs> but some, there are some similarities. I could guess go into the story of Zacchaeus, but that's not the particular subject at this time. I want to give you an idea of how they looked at these people. Another time when Jesus gave a person an unequivocal promise of salvation, it was another person whom everybody else thought was a terrible person and would never have sus suspected that they could ever have been saved. It was the thief on the cross. Jesus looked at the thief on the cross there in Luke 23 and verse 43. And Jesus said to the thief, He said, Verily I say unto thee today, Shalt thou be with me in paradise. Other people around did not think that there was any hope for this thief. I mean, he, after all, he's being crucified. He's a thief. He's getting his just desserts. There's no way that God would save someone like him. He was getting capital punishment for being a thief. But Jesus said to him, I tell you this today, you will be with me in paradise. And a third time that Jesus said to somebody, Thy faith has saved thee, which is at Luke 7.50, was the story of the alabaster box. This is the third time that Jesus said uh, this to a person whom other people thought could not be saved. And I want to go there. Let's take a look at this story. It's in Luke 7. So take your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 7. We're going to begin with uh, verse 37. Jesus here, uh, well in Luke 37 uh, and verse 37, it says, And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, get that? They're already saying she was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at meat. He was at a meal in a Pharisee's house here. She brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself. He's talking to himself. And he said, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. She is defiled. She is uh, uh, an outcast of God. God wouldn't want anything to do with her. That's what this man's thinking on the inside. And if this was a man of God, surely he would know that. Verse 40, And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. And Jesus said, There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. He says, Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou did not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Now let's look at verse 47 together here. He says, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. 
And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Notice this. This is the third time here. The third person. Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Now, those who were present there considered this woman to be a great sinner. And she had been a great sinner. So this is a story about salvation. Anytime Jesus said to somebody, you are saved, that is a story uh, that we should really study. It's a story about salvation. Did you know that there will be many people in heaven whom their neighbors thought would never make it there? Did you know that? Did you ever think about that? Did you know that there will be many people in heaven whom their fellow church members thought would not make it? And as I've thought about this, I have concluded that it is wonderful that the Lord decides our destiny. Otherwise, we would all be lost, I think. I don't think anyone would be saved if it was left up to each one of us who was going to make it uh, to heaven, who was going to have eternal life. There will be many people in heaven that their neighbors, neighbors supposed would never be there. They will be shocked, I think, at who will be found in heaven. I want to share with you something written in the book Christ's Object Lessons, which is a, a very beautiful book on the stories of Jesus. Notice this. Christ has plainly taught that those who persist in open sin must be separated from the church. But He has not committed to us the work of judging character and motive. He knows our nature too well to entrust this work to us. In other words, open sin we can see, we can deal with. But we can't uh, judge character and motive. We can't read the heart like God can. The author goes on and says, Should we try to uproot from the church those whom we suppose to be spurious Christians, we should be sure to make mistakes. Often we regard as hopeless subjects the very ones that, uh, whom Christ is drawing to Himself. Were we to deal with these souls according to our imperfect judgment, it would perhaps extinguish their last hope. Many who think themselves Christians will at last be found wanting. Isn't that interesting? Many will be in heaven whom their neighbors supposed would never enter there. Man judges from appearance, but God judges the heart. See, this woman was somebody that everybody else considered a hopeless case. Other people thought that her case was hopeless, and she was afraid herself that her case was hopeless. And maybe, maybe you've been tempted to think that your case is hopeless. Now let me tell you, this story shows that you can be saved. You think your case is hopeless? It's not. You can be saved. The people who are hopeless can be saved. Now here's a contrary statement from the same book, Christ Objects Lessons. Notice this. Many who think themselves Christians will at last be found wanting. Remember? You see, in the story, Simon thought that he was saved. He was a very strict Pharisee. But many who think that they are saved and who all the other people in the church uh, may think that they're saved, at the end they will be found wanting. They won't be saved. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that an interesting uh, thing to consider? You see, God reads your heart. God knows what is in your heart. He knows what's in your mind. Every moment. There is no fooling the Lord. So there are many people in the church whom everybody else in the church uh, thinks are going to be saved. They're actually going to end up wanting in the day of judgment. And there are other people about whom the people in the church say, you know, that person has had such a, a bad checkered past. There's no hope for anybody 
coming out of that. And yet, they'll be saved. That was the situation with this woman. This was a woman who was considered a hopeless subject. And she was saved. And if there is anybody here that thinks that uh, they are a hopeless subject, if you think you are a hopeless subject, I want to tell you, you can be saved. Don't worry about what your family thinks and what all your friends think and the people uh, where you work. Don't worry about what they think. They may think you're hopeless because maybe you've done some terrible things in the past. But don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. This woman here, was a, she was a terrible sinner. And yet, she was saved by Jesus. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says to us, For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance. Isn't that so true? Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. This woman was not considered a, a highly educated woman. Sometimes people think that it's important to know a lot of doctrines and a lot of theology. And, and I believe that we should study doctrines. The Bible tells us that. That we need to know and understand truths and doctrines. And uh, that the Scripture is given for doctrine or for teaching. That's what it says. And that's very important. Don't get me wrong. That is extremely important. But that is not the most important thing for salvation. You see, if your intellectual power, your ability to understand things, if your salvation depended mainly on that, well, do you know who would be in the first place in line for salvation? The devil. Satan himself. The devil is smarter than anybody in, that, that's, that's here. Anybody that's in the world. Any human being. You see, salvation does not depend primarily on your ability to explain and understand all kinds of theology. It doesn't depend upon that. Now, I've studied uh, theology for uh, many years. And if I didn't think it was important, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't study it. I remember when we, uh, in our church, were studying uh, prophecy. And specifically, uh, the prophecy found in Daniel 8 of the 2300 days. And some said to me that they, they tried to understand it, but they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't figure it out and explain that prophecy to anybody else. And some were wondering if this meant that they couldn't be saved. Because I cannot understand this prophecy. I cannot put together this timeline. Satan raised doubts in their minds that they would even be saved. And I'd say, well, of course you can be saved. It is important to study prophecy and to understand as much as we can. But we need to realize that how much we understand is not absolutely the most important thing. There is something that's even more important than that. And that's what this story is about. Now we know whom this woman was who anointed Jesus. We know who she was. If you turn to uh, John 11 or 12 or Luke 7 or Mark 14 or Matthew 26, you'll find it. But let's look at John 11 verses 1 and 2 together. Who was this woman? Now notice what it says here in John. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Huh, that's interesting, isn't it? Notice what it says. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So, who was it that did this to Jesus? It was Mary, the sister of Lazarus and the sister of Martha. That's who it was. And from the book, The Desire of Ages, I want to share something with you. Uh, sp speaking about uh, Mary. And by the way, you know, you can get uh, this book for free if you go to our website and just send in a request and we'll make sure that you get a copy. One of the greatest books on the life of Jesus outside of the Bible that I've ever found. 
But notice this. This is from the Desire of Ages. It says, Mary had been looked upon as a great sinner, but Christ knew the circumstances that had shaped her life. Isn't that wonderful? God knows our circumstances. You see, we look at, uh, at people and we don't... We, we just see the outside of the person. We see how they may be behaving, but we don't know the circumstances of their life. But God does. And praise Him for that. And He takes all that into consideration. But Christ knew the circumstances that had shaped her life. Seven times she had heard His rebuke of the demons that controlled her heart and mind. She had heard His strong cries to the Father in her behalf. She knew how offensive is sin to His unsullied purity. And in His strength, she had overcome. Notice that. In His strength, not her own strength, is impossible. She, she uh, had to go back to Him seven times. See, In her strength, it was impossible. But in His strength, she had overcome. And I've thought about that so many times. What would I have done if I were there? If I was there at that meal and I seen what had happened, what would I have done? How would I have reacted? Peter, James, and John were probably there at least some of the times. What would you do after Jesus had rebuked the demons out of a woman, let's say, five times? And then she got possessed with demons again. What would you do? Would you begin to think that maybe this one was a hopeless case? That'd be the temptation, wouldn't it? And she was considered a hopeless case. This Mary who anointed Jesus with the ointment, she had had the demons cast out of her seven times. Now, still, some are confused as to which Mary this is, but the Bible talks about this. Look at Mark 16, 9 with me. I don't know how you could be confused. The Bible is very specific about it. But some are. Mark 16, verse 9, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom He had cast seven devils. Now the, the same fact is also referred to in the first part of the 8th chapter of Luke. So this Mary, sister of Martha, sister of Lazarus, who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil. This was the same one whom we call Mary Magdalene. And she was the first one that Jesus appeared to after His resurrection. She was the first person who greeted the resurrected Christ. The disciples wouldn't listen to her when uh, she told them that Jesus was alive. You recall that? They thought that she was uh, drunk or delirious or something. Well, as I thought about the story of the alabaster box, I realized that there were actually, there were actually several lessons uh, that we should be learning by this story. So I listed some, and I want to I share some of the things that, that we can learn, or that we should learn from this story of the alabaster box. Now, one lesson is that there is enough grace and there is enough love to save the chief of sinners. This woman did have a very bad past. She did. Can't deny it. She didn't deny it. And I've already mentioned about the demons. Seven times. And I have, I have not mentioned, though, everything about her past because we don't have time to go into everything. But this woman had a very checkered past. She was a great sinner. They couldn't uh, describe how bad she was. They just said a great sinner. And everybody in town knew it. She had been such a bad sinner that Simon questioned whether Jesus uh, was even a prophet or not because uh, if he was a prophet, surely he wouldn't even allow that woman to touch him. But one thing we learn from the story is that no matter how bad you are, no matter how bad you've been, you can be saved by Jesus. The blood of Jesus can wash away all those sins. And that's wonderful good news, isn't it?
Isn't that wonderful news? There is enough grace, there is enough love in the heart of Jesus to save you. You know, often uh, pastors have people come to them asking, have I committed the unpardonable sin? I get that from time to time. Have I committed the unpardonable sin? Can I be saved? Is it too late for me to be saved? And people think they cannot be saved because they've done some terrible things in their life. Are you aware, friends, that there are going to be people in the kingdom of heaven who have committed murder? Are you aware that there are going to be people in the kingdom of heaven who have been involved in prostitution? Are you aware that there are going to be people in the kingdom of heaven who have been drug addicts? who have been alcoholics, have been slaves to smoking. There have been people that will be in heaven who have been serial killers. I want you to know that the Jesus of the Bible loves people and He has enough grace to deliver them from all their sins, no matter what those sins are. It doesn't matter. Jesus died to take away all those sins. If you want to be saved, if you truly want to be saved, you choose then, you must choose to put your trust in Jesus. And if you do that, if you put your trust in Jesus, and I'm talking about all your trust, you have to give it all to Him, well, friends, you will be saved. It doesn't matter how big the problem is in your life. It doesn't matter. You don't have any bigger problems in your life than this woman had. So no matter how bad you are, the Apostle Paul said that, that Christ came to this world to save sinners. And Paul said, of whom I am chief. Paul considered himself to be the worst sinner that ever lived. He's the chief of sinners. Apostle Paul was a murderer. He didn't murder criminals. <laughs> he murdered the saints of God. But he was saved. He wrote over half the books of the New Testament. He said in the next verse there of 1 Timothy 1.15 that God saved him as an example of what His grace could do. And that is one lesson that we learn from this story. You can be saved no matter how bad your past is if you're willing to come to Jesus and give Him everything. Give Him all of yourself. Give Him all your past sins. He'll take you and He'll cleanse you. He'll forgive you and He'll teach you and give you grace never to sin again. That's what this story teaches us. Another lesson that we can learn from the alabaster box is that the only people who will be saved uh, are those who recognize that they are sinners. And not only sinners, but, all, but, but terrible sinners. Do you realize that the Bible teaches that the uh, only people that can be saved by grace are sinners? seems silly to even ask. That's all. The good people don't need salvation. They do not need grace. But how many good people are there? Let's look at Matthew 19 and verse 17. And He said unto them, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So how many people are good from God's viewpoint? Not from a human viewpoint, but from God's viewpoint. How many people are good? None of us are good. Look at Romans 3, verses 10 to 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. There are, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. How many does Paul say? Not one. And that's what the Bible teaches. The only people who can be saved are bad people. The only people who can be saved are sinners. The good people don't need it. Let's look at Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? So, the good people, they cannot be saved by grace. They don't need grace. Only bad people can be saved. But the Bible says there are not any good people in the world. And from God's point of view, we are all bad. He says, you're so bad you cannot even understand how bad your heart is. That's what he said to Jeremiah. But bad people can be saved. That's the good news. Bad people can be saved if they will come to Jesus. Jesus came into this world to save sinners. Not in their sins, the Bible says, but from their sins. God does, just doesn't have you uh, keep sinning and sinning and sinning and He just keeps forgiving and forgiving. He teaches you and changes you. He says He will write His laws upon our hearts and our minds so that we can be overcomers of these temptations and get to a point through His grace never to sin again. Praise God for that, friends. Mary Magdalene got to that point where she never did that again. If we go back to the scripture in Luke 7 for this next lesson from the alabaster box, you see, it's not how much religion or theology or, or anything else that I know that counts most. What counts most is how much I love. And I'm not talking about a, a selfish love. I'm talking about a divine love. How much I, uh, uh, I love someone, a self-sacrificing charitable love. You know, not the self-preserving love, but a selfless love such as Jesus has. That's what I'm talking about. This is what the al alabaster box is teaching about the quantity of selfless love. Look at Luke 7 and verse 47. We go back to Luke 7. Luke 7 and verse 47. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same does what? loveth little. Now, sometimes people uh, misunderstand this and they say, well, I love God, so I can just do anything I please because I love God. Well, if you do anything you please, the Bible says you don't love God. In 1 John 5 and verse 3, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, for this is the love of God, that we do what? That we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. His commandments are not grievous. They're not hard to do. You see, when you give yourself to the Lord, He comes in. Like I said, He writes His laws on your heart and minds. They become a joy to you. God changes your desires from desiring selfish things. Self isn't in control anymore. God is in control. So He changes your desires from selfish things to divine things. And divine things are laid out in God's commandments. So don't let anybody deceive you with a bunch of smooth talk and say, well, I love God as they're breaking His commandments. The Bible says that the person who really loves God keeps His commandments. And if you're not keeping the commandments, you don't love God. Now, friends, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that. If you do not keep the commandments, you do not love God. You see, the first four commandments teach us uh, what it means to love God. 
And the last six, they teach us what it means to love our neighbor as God views it, see? And that's what we're interested in. We're interested in how God views it, see? Jesus said uh, that's all the commandments are. He says just those two principles. If you love God supremely and your neighbor as yourself, well, you're going to be saved by Jesus. That's what he says in Luke 10. You'll be saved by Jesus. Another lesson we can learn from the alabaster box is that real love is always expressed by words and actions. This woman was grateful for uh, what Jesus had done for her. He had delivered her from the power of the devil. She was grateful. How grateful was she? She was so grateful that she went down there where they sell perfume. And do you know how much that alabaster box of perfume cost? It cost the equivalent of a whole year's wages for a working man who worked six days a week. You see, in our, our world, at least in the United States, but most of the world, uh, people work five days a week. It hasn't always been that way. So it was the equivalent of a whole year's wages for someone who works six days a week. And the Bible said 300 denarii. And one denarii was one day's wages in those times. 300 would be 50 weeks. Six days a week. Real love will always be expressed, not by words only, but also uh, uh, by actions. Notice what the Bible says about this. Many years after this experience, the Apostle John, he was writing about this principle. And we, look, we find it in 1 John 3. 1 John 3, verses 16 to 18. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. But in deed and in truth. Notice, let us not just love people by what uh, we say, but we need to actually express our love by action. It takes both, doesn't it? Real love is always expressed, not just with words, but also with actions. And now we come to what I think is one of the hardest lessons that's taught uh, by the uh, alabaster box. And that is that it uh, exposes self-righteousness. Some people who are uh, professed members of the church will never understand the experience of the alabaster box. They won't be able to understand it. The church did not understand it in those days. Do you know what happened? Do you remember what happened when she anointed the Lord with the ointment? I mean, let's go back to Matthew 26 again. She has just anointed the Lord with the ointment. And, of course, the fragrance is going to go throughout the house. It's going to get everybody's attention. And the, the fragrance was going throughout the house. And notice what happened again. Let's go back to Matthew 26. What happened here? Matthew 26, verse 8 and 9 says, But when His disciples saw it, they saw her come in, they saw what she did, that fragrance goes out throughout the house. It says, But when the disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Wow. What else happened? Mark chapter 14 and verse 5. 
for it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. The margin says they scolded her. Isn't that something? What else happened? Remember how it's recorded in the book of Luke? Chapter 7, verse 39. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And who instigated all this murmuring? Well, that's found in John chapter 12. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was this not ointment, uh, excuse me, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Judas was the treasurer. He was in charge of the ministry finances. He didn't care. He didn't care about the poor. He was a thief. But notice that there these four things happened. First, the disciples said that what Mary did was a great waste and that she didn't have good judgment. That's what they're saying. She didn't have good judgment. Second, they said, it was extravagant. It was a, a lack of economy, and should not Christians practice economy? And third, they said that Mary was a great sinner. She was not qualified uh, to do something like this, even if it was right to do. She doesn't have the qualifications to do that. And the fourth thing they said was that uh, what she did lacked a purpose. In other words, her act lacked a purpose or she lacked wisdom. Now, do you know, beloved, and listen carefully, very often the people in the church who have the alabaster box are people whom other people consider to be the worst sinners, the worst sinners in the church. Very often the people who have the alabaster box are the people whom other people think are the least qualified, the poorest, the least educated, and those whose past have been checkered by the most awful sins. And so the same thing happens today that happened in Christ's day. People say it's not good judgment. They say it's a lack of economy. It's extravagant. They say, this person should not be doing it because they're not qualified. They're great sinners. It lacks wisdom and it, it will retard the work of God because this money could have been taken and put into welfare work and it could have done a lot of good. Now it's just been completely wasted. And so, they trouble the church members who have the alabaster box because it exposes their self-righteousness. They trouble the supposed workers of the Lord who have the perfume. They'll not let them alone. And by the way, Jesus said, let her alone. That's what He said. Let her alone. Leave her alone. They started a talking campaign, just like uh, Judas did. And the whole church, with all the leaders, can get stirred up against the person who has the alabaster box. Great indignation can be aroused, as we just read in Matthew 26. The person or persons with the alabaster box may become uh, very embarrassed then. Did this woman become embarrassed? She became so embarrassed that she was just about to sneak out if Jesus had not stopped things. The person with the alabaster box may be so afraid of the ministers or the teachers or the elders, the Marthas and the Simons, the Pharisees that are in the church, that they may just slink away and disappear. 
they may become terrified of their, their foes, the ministers, the elders, the teachers, Pharisees, Marthas, in the church who think that they do not have good judgment, who think that they, they lack economy, uh, that they're not qualified, they're terrible sinners. In fact, they may become so discouraged that they don't even come to church anymore. And don't think that it doesn't happen, beloved. Don't think that it doesn't happen. I want to tell you something. When all the people who have the alabaster box do not come to church anymore, that church is dead. You know why? The life of the church is in the alabaster box. And that is another lesson we learned from this story. The box contains divine love. And the life of the church is in the box. Somebody says, there is a whole year's worth of wages in the box. Enough money to feed the poor for years. That's what Judas said. There's enough money in there to feed the poor. Then somebody else looks at it and, and he says, well, it, it is sweet-smelling perfume, but it is sure awfully costly and extravagant. Is all that is in it just a year's wages? Just a, a lot of perfume? Is that all that, that's in this box? Oh, no, beloved. If all you see in the alabaster box is wages or perfume, you've missed the whole point of the story. What was in the alabaster box? Notice this again from the book Desire of Ages. That ointment was a symbol of the heart of the giver. It was the outward demonstration of a love fed by heavenly streams until it overflowed. How beautiful. How beautiful. In that alabaster box, there was all the love in Mary's soul. She had a lot of love for her Lord, for what He'd done for her. So she could not just get a, a little bit of perfume. She had to get a lot. Because that is how much love that she, that she had. And think about that and ask yourself, how much ointment is in my alabaster box? Is it a quarter full? Is it half full? Is it clear up to the top? How much love do you have for your Savior? Do you really love Him? Do you love Him enough to obey Him? Do you know there are lots of people all over the world that profess that they love Jesus, but they don't obey Him? Jesus said to the people of His generation, found in Luke 6 and verse 46. He said, And why call me, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? <laughs> why do you call me Lord, but yet you don't do the things that I say? Does it make any sense? And that is the tragedy of the Christian world today. People say, I love you, Lord, and they go directly contrary to what he says to do. That's not love, friends. Remember, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. But probably one of the most important lessons of all that we get from the alabaster box is that the oil, the fragrant oil that cost a whole year's wages, did not stay in the alabaster box. It was all poured out. Mary's love for Jesus was all encompassing. She didn't hold anything back. She poured out her love, all her love to Christ because He poured out all of His love for her. And this is a grand lesson for us, friends. What are we doing with our alabaster box filled with oil, filled with love? It's never going to do any good if we keep it in the box. I want to tell you, friends, there are people all around us who need some oil. There are people all around us who need some ointment in their lives. 
There are people who need the love of Jesus and He uses us to pour it upon them. So do you want to anoint your Lord? Or do you want to keep the oil in the box? I think we can now understand why Jesus said that the, the act of Mary would be included in the gospel wherever it is preached throughout all the world. It was a supreme act of love on Mary's part. Just as it was a supreme act of love by Jesus. For He really is the source. So do you want to receive salvation? Exercise faith. Take your alabaster box containing the oil of God's love and pour it out upon all. Jesus said, if you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. The fragrance of your selfless love will cover the whole earth and Jesus will say to you, thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again so very, very much for the story of the alabaster box. And Father, we pray that your love will fill us so much that it will be overflowing and we will share it and we will pour out all the contents of our alabaster box onto all. May they see Jesus in us. May we have the love of Jesus, Lord. We pray that we will see Him soon face to face. Let us share love with others as He has shared it with us. We pray this in His blessed name. Amen. Hello friends, I'm Pastor Joel Laswell. If you'd like more insight on the life of Jesus of Nazareth from the time that he was born there in Bethlehem and up until his second coming, then there's a book I'd love to give you entitled The Desire of Ages. To receive your free copy, please write to P.O. Box 1998, West Lafayette, Indiana, 47996. That's P.O. Box 1998, West Lafayette, Indiana, 47996. Friends, this is probably the greatest book on the life of Christ that's ever been written outside the Bible. So please request your free copy today.